good afternoon guys and girls. This is the second of a series of short horror stories that I have written which I am uploading to this YouTube channel. I hope you find them interesting. This one is a creature that I have created who is known as the Shemilt. And the story goes like this. I had rented a room for the summer in a foreboding looking house which had the name of Craig E. Moore, which is in an elevated position on a rocky promontory set back from the road. The house is on the coastline overlooking Porthy Avon west of Triada Bay on the beautiful island of Anglesey in North Wales. It is a large austere house with a Neo-Georgian style. The roof is of a grey slate with lichen growing on it. Its tall rectangular chimneys stretch upwards to touch the sky. Its dark wood window frames surrounding leaded windows add to the air of mystery. The house always seems to exude a feeling of dread, a sense of horror. And indeed the house looms out of the darkness and has the cold and foreboding look. From the road as you drive along the coast towards Holyhead and it would befit any of the mansions seen in the many Hammer horror films. I had rented a room there for the solitude and the beauty of the surroundings. I was hoping to write a book which had been floating around my mind for months. And the location lent itself to that possibility for writing and certainly provided much food for thought. I tried to set the mood within the room by lighting a few candles, hoping to create an atmosphere of suspense. I opened the French window. It led out onto a small bank balcony overlooking the Irish Sea. I sat on a chair and gazed out into the dark night. I noticed how still it was that night, just the gentle sound of the waves breaking upon the beach below, along with the sound of the shingles as they were shuffled around by the sea water. There was a slight breeze that night which entered the room causing the candles to flicker. Smoke danced like spirits in the eerie light which painted images of ghosts in my mind. After all this house must have its own past occupants within the very fabric of the building. The moon hung low in the sky and its reflection could be seen in the calm waters of Porthy Avon. The occasional cloud floated by, hiding the moon, which all led to a perfect atmosphere and one that I was certain would induce my mind and get the ink flowing. I sat there for quite a while with all manner of things going around my head. A feeling of peace that surrounded me. Everything was settling setting the perfect scene for me to start my book. It was so nice on the balcony that I decided to collect my pens and paper. I decided to start writing out there in the peace of my surroundings. I put pen to paper and began to scribble down notes with the occasional doodle. Ideas were coming thick and fast. But there was one idea that would not go away. It just kept on popping back into my mind. Perhaps this was the beginning of what would become a bestseller. I continued to write and the words seemed to flow from my pen with ease. Everything was so perfect. Then suddenly a blood curdling scream could be heard coming from the direction of the bay. I climbed back through the window put my shoes on, grabbed a flashlight and made my way down the staircase towards the front door. I followed the path 
walking down the cliff edge and onto the beach. I held my flashlight and scanned it across the beach and along the cliff edge but to no avail. I could not see or hear anything. The quietness returned and I went back to my room, trying to work out in my mind just what it could have been. Soon the night and the sea, fresh sea air lulled me into a deep sleep. I awoke the morning after and went down onto the beach again. There was no signs to say that any, anything had happened the night before. The scream was a sound that I will remember for a long time. My mind was working overtime trying to imagine just what it was I had heard that night before. As I walked around the bay I came across several caves which all seemed to go a long way into the surrounding cliffs each one dripping water and smelling of the sea with much seaweed washed into their gaping mouths. As I entered one of the caves I had a feeling that I was not alone. I looked around but saw nobody. I walked further into the cave and could hear what sounded like an animal growling. I decided to make my exit out of the cave and as I did something shot past my leg and out onto the beach and there it stood wagging its tail from behind me. I heard a voice saying, Where are you, George? George was a rather good-looking Staffordshire Bull Terrier. The voice was his owner, who emerged from the darkness within the cave. Hello there, he said. I hope old George didn't scare you. We began to chat, and he told me that he lived on the Isle of Anglesey, and inquired what I was doing there. I explained to him that I was an author and I had hired the room at Craigie Moor as I was hoping to write a new book. <coughs> Excuse me. He told me that he had a lot of knowledge about the house and the area and if I needed any information he would be willing to help me out. George continued to wag his tail and grumbled with impatience, wanting to continue his walk. The man told me his name was Andrew and he gave me his address and his phone number saying if I can help you feel free just let me know. I returned to my room and sat out on the balcony once again trying to write but my mind kept on going back to that awful scream. Andrew seemed to stutter a little before telling me that what I had heard would be the Shemilt. I had no idea that what he was talking about and again he stuttered and said the Shemilt is a creature of Celtic legend and it is set to wander the shores of Innis Cubby. Many have heard its terrible scream but only a handful of people have ever seen it and those who have are reluctant to talk about it. He told me that he knew of a man called Wing Lewis who I claim to have seen the Shemilt, and he promised to take me to see him. The time away had so far taken me away from my writing with one thing and another, but I dare not miss meeting someone who had seen the legendary creature. Deep in my mind I knew that this creature would consume my thoughts, and would become my new book, and perhaps, as I said, this could be one, the bestseller, I have always dreamed of writing. I arranged with Andrew to go and see this old gentleman in his home in Llangoch, a small place in the shadow of Anglesey Mountain, overlooking the busy port of Holyhead. I was filled with a sense of wonder as Andrew drove us along the road towards the house where Wynne had lived all his life. <coughs> we arrived at the cottage and walked down the path. There was a rose-covered archway which led to an ancient studded door in the centre of a double-fronted cottage. It had mullioned windows. 
The exterior was painted white, which was so very bright in the morning sun. With anticipation I knocked on the dragon-shaped door knocker. After what seemed an age the old door creaked open and there stood Wynne. He welcomed us into his home. The inside was quite dark with the glow of an old peat burning fire giving us light in the room. I could see that Wynne was advanced of age by the depth of the wrinkles on his face and selfishly hoped that he would remember what he could about his meeting the Shemilt. He offered us a seat and a drink. We all sat in the glow of the fire and began to introduce ourselves. Wing got out some tobacco and gently rubbed it between his gnarled old hands before packing it into his pipe. He lit the pipe and wind blew smoke towards the ceiling with some satisfaction. Right, what do you want to know, he said. His tale began with him being a much younger man who was a lobster fisherman around the coastline of Inniscubbe. He was out potting for lobsters every day when the weather permitted and sometimes when it was not so good. His weathered face told a story in itself of a hard life working in hard conditions. Wynne told me that while he was out on his boat setting the lobster pots that he had often heard the scream which had been attributed to the Shemilt. But he along with other fishermen always laughed it off and thought it was a trick of the mind and only the sound of the wind and the waves. Excuse me. As they rushed through the tortured and twisted granite rocks of the coastline. None of them had ever taken any notice of what they always thought was just folklore and legend, which had been created by the fishermen of old, as many of them had been lost at sea, and their superstitious minds had created a monster, as the cause of the many shipwrecks that occurred in centuries past. Wynne continued to tell me that the screams went by unheeded and they carried on with their daily, daily work along the shoreline. This was until one dark day on the 8th of November. The year was 1957. The sea was rougher than normal and the wind blew in almost gale force. Not the best conditions to be a fisherman but there was a living to be made and a family to be fed. The sea grew choppier and the screams grew louder. Wynne said he took no notice and carried on lifting his lobster pots, hoping for a good catch. Out of nowhere came a large wave that battered his small boat, driving it towards the coast in a bay called Morin. The wind increased and Wynne was helpless against it. His boat smashed into the rocks and sank into the dark waters of the bay. Wynne told me that he just managed to fight the waves and was able to drag his weary body up onto the beach. Breathless and cold he sat down on a rock and thanked his lucky stars that he had survived. It was then he said that he heard a terrible scream coming from a nearby cave. <coughs> he was so unnerved but thought the wind and waves crashing through the rocks and thought nothing else about it. Looking across the bay he sighed and his mind wandered and he thought what, what had happened and how on earth now would he be able to make a living and to provide for his wife and family. He told me that it was at this point he noticed something moving in the entrance of the cave. Thinking it was just driftwood or some other washed up item, he averted his gaze and slowly stood up. Still a little unsteady on his legs, he began to walk across the sand, stumbling occasionally as he went. Again he noticed something moving, as though it was alive in the mouth of the cave.
slowly he walked over towards the cave, then stopped dead in his tracks, as whatever it was up stood up and let out an ear-piercing scream. Thinking it may be another wounded fisherman, he carried on towards the cave to see, wondering if it was someone who needed help. Again a scream stopped him dead. Whatever it was was now walking back into the cave. He decided that he would follow to see what was causing that scream. The Shemilt was the furthest thing from his mind as he entered that cave mouth. Slipping on the wet rocks and seaweed he slowly made his way deeper into the murky darkness. There was a most unpleasant smell in the cave. He noticed that the cave floor was littered with bones which he took to be the remains of a dolphin or a seal. The cave walls began to take on an eerie texture. Strange shapes draped in seaweed everywhere. The smell grew ever stronger and he said he began to feel sick. Then from out of the darkness another scream so loud that it deafened him momentarily. He called out asking who was there and did they need help. The storm outside the cave was growing stronger and Wynne knew he only had a limited time to get out. <coughs> so in desperation he called out once again. Then he heard a movement and stood less than ten yards away from him was a creature the like of which he had never seen before. The creature stood around eight feet tall and he could see that it had a very dark skin and webbed hands. The creature screamed loudly and wind ran from the cave, falling against the walls and the strange ship covered in seaweed. As he stumbled into one it came away from the wall of the cave and there wrapped in a cocoon was the decomposing body of a man. There were so many of these ox shaped things hanging from the wall. He stumbled into others which fell to the floor. Each one contained the decomposing remains of men, women and children. The tales of old flooded his mind and the legend of the Shemilt. He ran as fast as he could across the beach through the bushes. The brambles tore at his clothing and his flesh. The nettles stung him. Once again he heard it scream, but this time it was getting much closer. Finally he got off the beach and onto the Holyhead Road. Luckily for him, although the road was normally quiet, a car appeared over the hill. Breathless he flagged it down, and the driver kindly gave him a lift and took him to a hospital at Penross. The nurses cleaned the wounds and calmed him down. Then the doctor came to see him. Wynne told the doctor what had happened. The doctor did not believe him and told him it was just an effect of delirium caused by drinking seawater, coupled with exhaustion. Wynne went home and related the story to his wife, just the story that he had related to me. He was visibly shaken by the recollection of his story. I thanked him and left with Andrew, who drove me back to Craigie Moor. On the journey back, Andrew asked my thoughts. I told him I was fascinated and thought it would be a wonderful idea for a book. Then I remember Wynne's last words to me. Whatever you do, don't go down to the beach at Morin. Morin Beach was just a short walk away from where I was staying and my interest had been heightened by Wynne's story. Especially as it had makings of such a great horror story. My mind went to a book launch, interviews with the press. The possibility of the book could become a blockbuster film. I had for a while believed that the horror world had grown tired of its usual monsters and slashers and the Shemilt of Wind's warning was still ringing in my ears. I opened the French windows of my room again and sat on the balcony. The night was a fresh and gentle, 
breaking of waves below, a far cry from the storm we had spoken of. I poured myself a glass of whisky and I sipped it slowly, my mind working overtime. I would sleep on it and decide what to do in the morning. The night was largely restless, unable to get from my mind Wind's story. Drifting off to sleep, then waking up hearing the screaming in my head. The shemilt had certainly whetted my appetite. I walked into Triada Bay and I had a lovely Welsh breakfast in the sea shanty cafe. As I ate, I gazed out across the bay. I was in deep thought, and it was then my decision came to ignore Wynne's warning and to make my way to Morin. There was a chill wind in there as I made my way on the coastal road. The fresh salt sea air would be good for me and blow the cobwebs of the last few days from my mind. I came to an opening in the hedge which was largely overgrown and just as Wynne had described it, with bushes, brambles and nettles. I gingerly made my way through the overgrown path. With torn trousers, scratched legs and nettled hands, I got through and stood at the entrance to the beach. The beach was strewn with driftwood seaweed and assorted pieces of rubbish which had been washed in by the tide. Within ten yards of walking on the beach I found the decomposing remains of a grey seal, its mouth in a contorted state with teeth exposed, where seagulls had been feasting upon its carcass. I looked out across the bay which was quite calm and tried to imagine that night which had almost brought about the demise of Wynne. As I looked down the cliffs I noticed dripping with water a cave. I tried to look into the gloom but knew that it would be not be possible as when in the light it is impossible to see into the dark. But for anything stood in that darkness it would be able to see me stood there quite easily. With trepidation I made my way towards the first cave. The tide was going out so I knew that I had plenty of time to explore and perhaps solve the legend of the Shemilt. I believed within my mind that this would be a great book. Perhaps that one which is said that everyone has one good book within them. I began to remember the story of the decomposing remains of people and the terrible screaming monster and almost turned back but my hunger to put myself where Winnet stood was overwhelming. So there I was stood in the mouth of one of the caves. The cave was dark and dank and not tempting at all. I entered I was walking over driftwood and seaweed rubbish left behind by visitors, beer cans, wine bottles, McDonald's boxes. The cave smelled and seaweed clung to the rocks. I guess as I walked towards the rear of the cave it suddenly became very small with the roof only inches from the floor. There were no signs of bones, no strange shapes clinging to the walls just an awful smell which pervaded my nostrils. I sighed and made my way out of the cave, blinking as I entered the daylight. I moved to another cave which was littered with driftwood and seaweed. The same dark dankness awaited me. Icy cold water dropped from the roof, down the collar of my shirt making me shiver. I walked further into the cave staring at the walls and as I made my way into the darkness I saw nothing to worry about. This cave smelled even worse than the first one and underfoot were the rotting remains of some jellyfish. Not pleasant at all, it was so bad it made me wretch. The cave narrowed again and became smaller and smaller. I turned to make my way out and I heard what sounded like a distant scream. 
I put this out of my mind and I walked onto the beach again. I took some deep breaths of sea salt air. Becoming disillusioned, I sat for a while <coughs> and wondered if old Wind's story was just a tale that he liked to tell to give him some credibility within the community of fishermen. I entered the third cave which was bigger than the others, a large gaping mouth which had been carved deep into the cliff face by the erosion of time. I had to wade through the rock pools in order to enter the cave crabs scattered on the small rocks, fish departed past my ankles as I walked. Finally I was there at the entrance gazing into the darkness. I heard a growl and fully expected to see George and Andrew come running from the cave, but they did not, so I put it down to the wind and waves. A short way into the cave I came across some bones which looked like the ribs and the vertebrae of what could have been a seal. The smell was once again terrible and I really felt ill with the stench. It was really gut-wrenching. The walls started to take on different appearances, with stained shapes hanging there wrapped in seaweed. My heart began to race. I remembered what Wynne had said. I carefully walked past them so as not to disturb them. There was another growl from the darkness which created fear in me. But my logical mind told me not to be ridiculous as the Shemilt was just a legend. I convinced myself that all would be well, and I walked further into the cave. I noticed that on the cave floor there were items of clothing, bags, and right in the middle was a camera. Whose was it? How long had it been there? And what would be on it? My heart began to race again as I heard a noise in the darkness, a kind of shuffling noise, as though someone or something was coming towards me. A large figure emerged from the gloom. It was far too big to be human. It had large eyes and a scaly body with webbed hands and feet. I turned to run from the cave and as I did I heard a terribly deafening scream coming from behind me. As I ran, I stumbled, falling into the cave wall and through a seaweed cocoon, causing the contents to fall to the cave floor. What I saw made me feel so nauseous. Right there on the cave floor was a corpse staring up at me. Its sardonic smile was hideous, eyes still wide open, showing the fear it had experienced before its death. Savage bites were on the victim's neck and deep scratches raked across the torso. I ran again only to fall into the wall of the cave again. And this time the shock of what I witnessed will stay with me until the grave. There, cocooned in the seaweed, were the mortal remains of Andrew, the man who had introduced me to Wynne Lewis. I made my way towards the light of day and there right behind me was the sound of growling. My heart momentarily stopped as I thought that I would soon be the next victim of the Shemilt. Something hit my leg hard. I closed my eyes and prayed for a mercifully quick death. A strange eerie silence fell within the confines of the cave walls. Was I to be spared the terrible fate that had befallen these poor innocents? Once again something hit my leg quite hard and I heard a growl, again which was amplified by the natural acoustics within the cave. <coughs> my heart racing. I carried on the instinct to survive had now taken over. I was only yards from the cave entrance, the daylight was quite blinding after being in the depths of the earth. I heard another growl as I stumbled out onto the beach. Scarcely daring to move, I lay there for a while, trying to get to grips in my mind with what I had seen. I closed my eyes and thanked God for saving my mortal soul. 
from the monster within the cave. Suddenly, I felt something crawling up my body. A feeling of wet coldness touched my cheek. I thought, this is it. My time is up. There was another growl. And as I opened my eyes, there stood George, Andrew's dog. He wagged his tail and snuggled close to me, and I wondered what horrors he had witnessed. I stroked his head and made my way off the beach with him. Since that day I have forgotten all about writing a horror story, and I have devoted my life to George and he to me. We have become inseparable, and my life's work is now to warn everyone of the monster, known as the Shemilt who dwells in a cave on Morin Beach. Thank you all once again for listening. I do apologise for the occasional cough. I have a little tickle in the throat. If you like the story, please feel free to leave a comment. Please subscribe to the channel. Click the subscribe bell. Uh, forget the notifications. And as always, thank you. Namaste.